Let's start today's episode by looking at something embarrassing. Presenting my first ever code doc, which I built for a contest. In a nutshell, this is a habit tracker that uses my own novel technique. It motivates you to set reasonably low daily goals so that it's easier for you to actually do it every day and then rewards you for overachieving them. In fact, this dog has a lot of history and I'll be glad to tell you all about it on my next live stream if you ask. But none of that is important for our today's lesson. Today, let's take a look at how I built it before I knew any better. The first thing that you can see that even back in the day, I tried to make it a very hand-holding and user-centered experience. For example, I went the extra mile to include these welcoming messages for the user. This message, for example, will tell you how you're doing with your goal, depending on whether you're just starting out or you're halfway there or you're done with your goal for the day or exceeded it, it will show you a different status message. Let's take a closer look at how this was implemented. Okay, first thing, pardon for the unformatted and unreadable code, back in the days I didn't know that you could actually format it with new lines. This is much better, don't you think? Hmm, what can we see here? Already a few messages included in the formulas code, one for the unstarted challenge and one for the already finished challenge, and then all the actual ongoing statuses are tucked away in yet another two formulas. Let's take a look. Oof. Oof, that stinks. Can you understand anything out of the formula like that? Not only it's unstyled, it has all these messages intertwined with the rest of the code. Even if you go and fix the code styling to make it more readable, this still stinks because pieces of text like that don't belong in the formulas. Imagine willing to update your template message. You have to go and find which formula it's in, maybe it's used in multiple formulas, and then you have to go and edit the formula's code. And then imagine it's not you, but somebody whom you built this doc for a non-technical person who just wants to change the message. Or what if you gave this doc to a localizer who just wants to translate it in their own language and they don't know coda, don't know formulas and would be afraid to even touch them. Do we really want to let them go into the formula code and change it there? No, we don't. Instead, we want to get rid of these so-called hard-coded values and put them into an external utility table and reference them from there. And in this short video, let me teach you how to do it right. Let's go. Okay, seriously, the rationale was probably longer than the trick itself. All you have to do is create this utility table, call it HLP templates, let it have two columns, the display column for the name so that you can reference the template, and the column for the template's content itself. Now, whenever you want to hard code a piece of text in your formula, you don't do it. Instead, you go here, add a row, give it a unique name so that you can reference it easily, put the message there, and it reference it in your formula like that. And that is it, that is your best practice. However, I cannot just end my video like that. Let's also talk about intricacies, quirks and other use cases. Okay, the first thing to know is that yes, while you will sometimes use these messages as is, more often you will actually use them as templates for the format formula, hence the table's name. So it totally makes sense to talk more about the format formula. The format formula composes a text out of a template and parameters. It takes the template text as its first argument, looks for placeholders in curly braces like 1, 2, 3, and replaces them with the following first, second, third and so on parameters respectively. Unfortunately, it doesn't support name parameters, so you're stuck with just the indices 1, 2, 3 and so on. However, you can totally use these placeholders in whatever order and repeat them as many times as you need. You don't have to use them in order or only once. And that's pretty much it. The only thing it can do beyond that is for numbers, you can also specify how many digits you want to have before and after the decimal point. There is also one bug with the format formula that you must know is that you cannot use it in chained mode. You cannot write it like the template dot format and then supply your arguments to populate the template. You always have to use it in nested mode and supply your template as the first parameter. However, what this formula can finally do, they fixed it in 2022, is properly fill out styled elements. So your template can have colorful bits, bold bits, as well as these parameters can be headings and other paragraph formats. And the format function will properly apply this styling onto inserted values. The only thing to watch out here though is that you have to supply these values as text. So if you have a number or a date there, apply two text on it. Otherwise, it will insert these values as rich values and will not apply that formatting onto them. It's
it's one of those few cases where two text is actually a legitimate fix. Since the placeholders for the format function are numbered and not named, another good idea could be adding a yet another column to your templates table with the instructions as to which number corresponds to which argument. So that when you use this template in your formula, you can use a little help. And just in case you didn't think of it, if you have a conditional formula with many templates, but the arguments to each of these templates are largely the same, give or take one, you can rewrite your formula like this so that you don't have to repeat your code. The second thing is that you might be now wondering what's the best column type for these templates. Should it be text or should it be canvas? The format function works with both of them. On one hand, canvas offers more formatting options that you don't have with text. Like you can use callouts and multiple columns and you can even put functional buttons and checkboxes and toggles. For some reason, not other object types at the moment, but that already opens up a lot of tricks. Only with a canvas, you can have a greeting template like this. For an existing user in the dock, it will give them the sense of how many tasks they have. And for a new user, it will show them a greeting with a button that the user can then click and it will create all the necessary rows and pages for that user. So it feels like it's a no-brainer choice, right? But at the same time, canvases are clunkier. Like at the moment, you cannot directly edit the canvas in the cell without opening the row model. Although I think this capability is coming soon and when you're watching this, it is already possible. And text values are generally more lightweight and they still offer a lot of formatting options. Like you can still use different sorts of character and paragraph formatting. Even and headings and checklists and even a horizontal rule. So Paul, whichever shall we use? And my answer is, why not both? What I personally do lately is I add two columns, one for text and one for canvas. And when text is enough, I just use the text column. And when I need all those things that only canvases offer, I use the canvas column. There is really no performance or doc size overhead if your text values are blank or your canvases are not initialized. All I have to do when I add reference a template is remember which column to use. Okay, we've covered all sorts of messages and alerts, that is clear. Now, what else do I put on the templates table? The first is formatted button labels. I talked about this in an episode on buttons. Using templates is one way how to have colorful button labels without using hidden formulas. The second thing that I often have as a template is the right aligned paragraph. That's right, just the placeholder, but with the right aligned style. I use it when I need to force right alignment of a table column that is not a number or currency, because only those get right aligned by default. The third set of templates I often use is the heading templates. And the reason for that is sometimes I want to combine text of different sizes without the spacing that comes between different level headings. The workaround for that is to construct your text with a formula. The template will use heading style and apply heading font and size to the content. But the formula itself will be paragraph style, which will put it in line with the rest of your page text. So no any extra spacing. That's a bonus trick for you. The fourth thing I usually have on my templates table is the horizontal rule. I don't always need it, but sometimes I want to join some messages with a horizontal rule. Since there is no way to create it formulaically, this is one way how you can have it. And finally, the fifth thing is a pair of checklist items, a checked and unchecked one. That's because in the formula language we have formulas to render a list of values as a bullet list or numbered list, but not as a checklist. So if I need to render a checklist with a formula, I will use these two templates to correspondingly render checked and unchecked items. And then I can use indent by to put these items on a proper per nesting level. There is one gotcha with the checked item though, it will not appear as checked unless you put something else onto it, not just the placeholder. It can be a trailing space or the empty character like we talked about in the 10 plus 1 tips video. Actually you can copy it from the doc that's linked in the description. And that is all I can think of at the moment, the rest of the templates depend on what your doc is about. Since this is a utility table, there are absolutely no rules what else you want to put in there as long as it makes sense and saves you time. Like in some cases I have a separate table for uploads and images and in some cases I just add a column to this templates table because I don't need many of them and it's just faster and easier. And sometimes I have a separate table for code templates and sometimes I also put them here in the HLP templates. Again, this is not a data table, you don't have to worry about it too much. Finally, a few more things to watch out for. First, watch out for trailing new lines. It's very easy, especially in canvases, to leave a blank new line in the end. All it takes is a mouse click. These will carry over to your values, so make sure to delete them. This can be a little finicky, especially if you just have a horizontal rule, for example. You cannot click backspace right away, you'll erase what you just did. You have to click your mouse elsewhere and then back to your new line, and only then you can delete it. 
The second thing is always check your results. Some pieces of the canvas will not carry over to the result of the format formula. For example, if you want to make navigation with these card-like buttons, they will just collapse into these things, so you cannot really use them. The third thing to watch out is that when you look at these templates in the table, they are always expanded to the whole width of the column. But when you use these values in formulas, they will actually be cramped into as narrow pieces as possible. Like the horizontal rule, you would expect it to span the whole page, but it will only be as wide as the rest of the content. So far, the only way that I know to artificially push your template wider is to take a white space character and repeat it a good thousand times. But of course, it will introduce a blank new line, which is less than ideal. If I ever come up with a better way, I will let you know in the comments. Finally, there are situations where you won't put all the messages into your templates table. For example, you may have a table of log message types, and it makes sense to put templates for each of these message types right there. Now, that is totally fine. I will not force you to put all your messages in a centralized table and then link to it. That's a lot of stupid and unnecessary work, and after all, we're doing this to save ourselves time. But a nice gesture would be to include links to all those other pages from your HLP templates page. Okay, that was a lot of information for for an episode that I intended to be short. Why does it always happen like that? In the beginning I think, oh, it's just one table. But then I start remembering all the nuances and suddenly it passes the 10 minutes mark. Okay, I promise the episode on Thursday will be super short. There is another utility table that is logical to tell you about after the templates, but there's nearly not as much to talk about. So yes, this is all from me for today. Please give this video a like, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, please leave me a comment and let me know whether you like this video or not, and please, please, please support me on Patreon if you haven't already. In the next few days I will finally set up dog distribution, so if you pledge to the tier that allows you getting dogs, you will get them pretty soon, so don't lose your chance. If you don't subscribe in February, you will miss out on the February docs. As much as I'd love to always share everything I've got, I have to keep it fair towards the long-term patrons who subscribed earlier. So if all of this was helpful for you so far, why not support it? I'm not monetizing it otherwise, and it's only your support that will help me keep going.